Okay, everyone, thank you again so much. It is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Musimbi Kanyaro. She is the president and CEO of Global Fund for Women, who we just saw a film about that. She is one of the world's best known voices speaking on behalf of rights of women and girls and human rights. She has written about and given speeches on issues including technology access, violence, mutilation of women, climate issues, capacity building. And she, has, she holds doctorates in uh, two, two fields, linguistics as well as feminist theology, and is a leader of three decades ex of experience managing international non-governmental organizations, global programs, and ecumenical agencies. She serves on several international boards, including Aspen Leader Council, the UN High Level Tax Task Force for Reproductive Health, CARE, the UN Women Civil Society Advisory Board, and PEPFAR, um, Scientific Advisory Boards. I don't think we could have found a better or more appropriate voice for today's meeting. I want to welcome Dr. Kenyaro for coming, and she has taken time from her very, very busy schedule to do this. We are fortunate because by tomorrow she will be in Geneva. Uh, one day's difference, and we might have missed her. Uh, my understanding is she loves questions, and she loves interaction with the audience, so I would encourage you to answer or ask questions, and she welcomes your remarks and um, comments. Um, Again, a um, well, warm welcome for Dr. Kenyaro. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in a room full of lawyers. <laughs> and so what I said, what I was not going to do this afternoon is to speak law. I can speak about law, but I won't speak law. So don't expect that from me today. I am really delighted to be invited in this um, seminar because the seminar which talks about justice and equality for women really speaks to me. It speaks to my life. It speaks to what I do. And really, indeed, for me, deep down in my heart, I'm convinced, and I want to say I'm convinced beyond reasonable doubt, <laughs> that the most important and highest moral obligation for men and women is to treat each other as equals. If we only did that and treated each other as equals, we wouldn't need to be having this session. And I think I wouldn't need the job that I'm doing. So unfortunately, this is not what we do. So while gender equality has really many, many assets, there is no trade-off for the fact that men and women, and uh, I want to also say, and trans people are human together. It is our right to be human. And that gender equality is a human right, and that's why I am passionate about it. So I work on gender issues from the perspective of the rights basis. I work mostly with women, and I have done that for nearly three decades. Traveling world over, interacting with women at grassroots level, as well as with policy makers at various levels, and with funders. And the current place where I am is a place between philanthropy and human rights activism. It's a place between women and what they do and a place and, and, and the money that is needed to do their work. So sitting here this morning, I just began to rewrite my speech because I did notice that I don't need to give illustrations from violence against women. I think we get it. We had quite very good illustrations. From trafficking, I think we get it. We have had quite in-depth work from that. And several other references to sexual and reproductive health. Because these three, when you're doing violence, sexual reproductive health, and economic justice and participation, 
you are actually touching most of what spells out the inequality that exists between men and women in our societies. And I dare say, in our societies, in every country in the world. Because as of last year, with all of the work that was done through the United Nations, and we had some exposure to that today, and through other agencies, the verdict is out. There is no country in the world which has achieved gender justice and gender equality. Nowhere, no country in the world. We are all in this together. We are traveling together in it. There is a lot to do. And the opportunity here, which is what I would like to ride upon today, the opportunity here is we are living in 2016 when the consciousness that if we do something about gender equality, not only is it going to bring us dividends and benefits to individual persons, but it actually runs throughout the whole limitless, limitless areas of our lives, our economies, our health systems, our cultures, our religions, just achieving gender equality. Goal number five of the 17 Millennium Development Goals will take us much further than we expected because we are dealing with 50% of the human race, sometimes 50% of the populations in some countries, and in other countries, especially countries in conflict where there is death and other aspects that take men away, you could be talking about 60 and 70 percent of populations. So that's the frame in which I come. I learned a long time ago that when we talk about justice, we don't mean just us. Justice is not just us. So let's begin by talking about men in order to arrive at justice for, for women. Many of the things that we have said today actually bring men in the room, whether we liked it or not. What do men as a distinct group have to do with justice for women? Maybe the correct answer could be everything, something, or some things, whatever, but definitely men do have something to do with gender justice because gender, as we know it, is a determinant of social relations. And these social relations, whether they are gendered by biology or gendered by other socializations that we experience, what they actually spell quite clearly, and I think is very definite with all of us, is the power relations how it plays into the power relations. So achieving gender equality is not going to be possible without many, many, many men realizing their own enslavement in the masculine frame of power ownership. And without them actually realizing that they too are suffering and need the change. They need the change. So to achieve gender justice and using that frame of justice, we must recognize a name that change requires us dealing with privilege. And we need to be able to see how privilege accustomizes anyone in a particular privilege to be part of the injustice that that privilege causes. And we could take this out of the frame of, uh, of uh, justice for women and put it into justice for um, poor people, justice for people who are trafficked, justice, race justice, and we will always find that the power aspect of whoever is owning the privilege at that time, in the moment or in history, has everything to do with actually getting the justice that is required. So very often men in their diverse roles um, 
They are family members. They are our children. They are our grandchildren, our husbands, our friends, our partners in different ways. And that part of the relationships, even when it has issues, we can excuse it almost because there's something else that it does for us. Relationally, there is a lot that gets excused in, 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 on gender issues. But sometimes these issues translate into um, other areas of our lives. The same man who was my brother today and is the boss of a company that wouldn't let women into the higher places becomes a completely different thing. The same man who is my father and is in a military and is in the front line responsible for the rape of those women in the DRC and other places that you in this room will be aware of. It becomes a different place. So what very often we see happening is that men do share one in not actually analyzing, analysis was pointed out, analyzing the how gender influences their, actu uh, their actions. And very often, they don't describe themselves as looking for gender justice. Women look for gender justice. Um, the second thing is that men often, with knowledge or without knowledge, defend, they recognize and they defend their place of power in those places. You could see if you go to some countries and you look at the laws, if you use law as a frame, you will see that there are laws, a lot of laws, that prohibit women from doing certain things. So for example, a married woman can't go out alone. A woman should not drive, um, etc. Those things don't actually inflict on taking anything from a man if a woman drives. It doesn't take anything from the man, but it's protecting a certain, a certain place so that it could remain distinctively a male space. We have a lot of those kind of laws and regulations and rules in every continent. In my own, I'm African. I could bring laws and laws and laws of those kind of practices. So what is happening then as women look uh, for liberation for themselves, but also for equality. Because right now, when we are focused into gender equality, we are going to have to say, we are going to be looking for justice for everybody. Justice that will cover women and justice that will cover men. And we're gonna have to find new methods of actually ensuring that men are getting engaged somebody is going to have to take that responsibility. Let me divert and give you an example of why we at the Global Fund for Women have focused women. It's a gender analysis that has focused specifically women. And I want to do this by borrowing a frame from Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa in her unstoppable service to humanity in India had said once, if I look at the masses, I never act. If I look at one, I will act. Here is my one. On March 9, 2011, during a violent sweep of protest from Tahir Square in Egypt, army officials arrested and detained 18 women activists. While under custody, the women were beaten, electrocuted, and subjected to strip searches and virginity tests by the male soldiers in front of crowds and onlookers. One army general justified the test as a way to protect the army against possible rape allegations and to prove that these women weren't virgins after all. What would they be doing out there making the protest? Upon being released, most women kept silent, fearing alienation, 
and the other consequences that could come with speaking up. One woman, however, refused to be silenced. Samira Ibrahim filed the lawsuit against the army and she won. But Samira was represented and supported by three leading Egyptian women rights groups who were supported by the Global Fund. Nadim, Center for, 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 for Women's Rights, Nazra, the Feminist Studies Center, and the New Woman Foundation. These women's organizations gathered the needed evidences, providing this to the lawyers. They surrounded her. They ensured that she wasn't in danger until the case was won. What made Samira courageous to stand up? And I could tell you stories of other individual Samiras. I could tell you a story of a Samira called Josephine from DRC, who was in the front line of refusing to be quiet with the notorious soldier rape of women in DRC. I think if you have not studied that case and you're a lawyer in here, the rape that happened to women in DRC, the numbers, the mere numbers, is more than you want to know. It's large numbers of women who are raped. But those women, those individual women, who said we will not be silenced anymore and stood up is another courageous Samir. And we stand with those women. We stand with those women or it could be the story of a young woman in Malawi, Banda, who after realizing and coming to senses to herself that she could do something about child marriages, marrying young girls as young as 11 years and nine years to older men, many of them who tested or not tested, are liable to being HIV infected, etc., and organized. And we supported them for years. And the girls and the women and the women's organizations behind them managed to get a law passed. And today, we are not looking for the law. We are looking for the implementation. Because as all of you will know, there are plenty of really good laws in the world that could protect women from various things that we care about. But they are often not implemented because of many reasons, one of which being the very people that have to implement and even police them don't believe in those laws because some of those laws have come out by very, very strong activism that is supported by grassroots human rights, women's rights, civil rights movements. And so a law comes into place, but change does not take place in people's minds. And so the law stays in the book, in the books. And women and other people, civil society, have to go back into really strong advocacy to implement those laws. And then it becomes case by case. And it takes a very, very long time before those laws become the practice um, and then the exploitation, I'm sure you are aware of that. The exploitation of lawyers themselves, knowing that after all, it doesn't matter how long they could be able to postpone the hearing of those laws until such a way that, such a time that the persons who are bringing the cases are tired, are dead, give up. This is one of the other common areas that makes the laws and in the places where we are um, not be um, adhered to. I come from Kenya. Recently, we had a law within our new constitution, which I tell you is really good. If we practiced it, we would be so much better than the USA. But I don't know if we'll even practice half of the good that is in the new constitution. But one of the things that it allows us is it allows women to inherit land, 
Land inheritance, many of you probably are working on that area, is still, or property ownership, is still one of the areas in the economic sector of the gender injustice that really puts women down. It really puts women down. 80% of the farmers in Africa are women, but they don't own the land, and many of them will farm, and if they are producing export crops, the person who owns the money is the owner of the land, the father, the husband, the brother, the brothers-in-laws, and the list goes on. So ownership of property is another area that is really important. So having illustrated, I think I want to go quite fast now to say how do we bring about change and what is the frame that has been important to us for the Global Fund for Women. So first of all, we realize and I think that anybody who has ever been colonized by anything or anybody, you know that freedom doesn't come to you on a silver plate. Just, oh, I colonized you yesterday and here is your freedom. No, it doesn't come that way. And uh, Audrey Lourdes, uh, the African-American um, uh, theologian, once said, you can't also use your master's tool to get to your freedom. So one of the major reasons why we at the Global Fund took an option to particularly work and support, with, support bold, courageous women organizing for change is we want the women to hold and own their own power to find their own liberation within the context which set them up. Because these issues are similar, but how we approach and find solutions is very contextualized. And unless that context is taken into place, you don't actually get there. So we use four frames to try to get to where the change is. And, and uh, in our four frame where we want to see the change happen, we want to see change happen at individual level, where there's an increased awareness of every woman, every girl within the society of what is it that keeps them in their place, keeps them down, or defines their place? Because that place where we often are is not our place. We are asked to be that that's your place, but it's not our place. It's a place that we are either kept by tradition, it's a place that we are kept by poverty, it's a place that we are kept by race, by our own sexual orientation, by choices that we have made. It's a place that is made for us. So that first consciousness is important for us. So we track change by saying, are women and girls getting sufficiently conscientized to take up and own their voice and do something? And who is that disruptor that we can actually invest in as a leader and as a leader of organization? And why organizations? Because when you are picked alone, that's the end of the story. You could be a really good activist, a good lawyer, a good doctor that provides, for example, abortion services to a group of people that need them, etc. But alone, you are very vulnerable. So we find women who are leading but are lodged in organizations and groups that are supportive to them. And we find those groups. We find those groups that are creating greater consciousness within that community because change is not going to happen at the United Le Nations level or even at the national level or even at the regional level. Change needs to happen at the local level where something is happening. So even if it's just educating the people about what is happening. You come from a community that, for example, um, justifies that uh, uh, we need to have women circumcised so that, and you know what that so that is, can complete the sentence. You believe it over years, and then a consciousness comes to you. The biggest responsibility is helping everybody else be as converted as you are. Come to terms with that so that together you can actually reframe that picture and find an answer to it. 
So that's really important for us. The next thing is that we want at that individual and formal level increased resources and information that help people to find solutions. So if they are in a community, we want to know that they are aware of how to get help quite quickly. If a case requires a lawyer and you are just a person of the community, you're not going to be able to get success in picking that thing by yourself. So we fund them to know where are the resources. Those resources could be financial, they could be knowledge, they could be access, they could be more community, they could be working with other organizations to network them, or they could be actually providing services or advocacy voices. And we fund them to actually really ground that work in changing norms. Norms is just what I talked about. When something is normal, you don't, ev even if it hurts you, you just take it for granted that it's okay to endure a little pain because that's it. So people go to do studies in many parts of the world and they come back and they say, women talk to the women and many of the women said it's, uh, it's all right for a husband to beat them once in a while, that that's just, you know, that's just how it is. And some even, some of the researchers that you and I read even say, many women said, it, a woman who gets beaten feels loved because the husband has paid attention to them. I am sure, have you read any of that research? There are some researches that come out with those kind of statements. They are ridiculous statements, but you cannot say that they are not uttered statements if people have collected that data and the data exists. So why do they get uttered? Because those issues have become norms for people. So to change that practice, you have to change the norms. So we find to see that social norms that are not encouraging, ensuring that gender justice is, uh, is there um, are, are actually addressed. And we fund to make sure that there are tools and instruments that will sustain that. The tools and instruments could be laws, could be policies. And then these tools and in instruments actually have the potential to be enforced. And when we look at the potential to be enforced, we have to look at the resources for enforcing them, people resources. So we find groups that are saying, okay, we have a law, but the policemen in my community have no idea about how to deal with a woman who goes to report rape. So they need training and they advocate for that training and they see that it's happened. Or we find people who are able to, see, to say, we have a law and this law can enable us to get X but the women in the community don't know. So they need the resources, they need to gather, and they organize trainings and trainings and trainings and trainings and real help and drill women to know what is good for them and how they can be able to claim it. So we find those kind of groups and we are bold. We find groups that are doing things sometimes which are way before their time in terms of the community knowing them, for example, for the 30 years that the Global Fund has been there, from day one, Global Fund was aware that the sexual area, sexual reproductive health and rights, especially the sexual orientation, is a, was an issue before its time. Today, we can talk very openly about LGBTQI rights, and we affirm them in some places. But I tell you, they still cause death, and there are many, many communities in the world where uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be, to make that, to be who you are and to even make a choice for yourself on when you'll get married if you do or to have children or not to have them and to have how many. All those are really like dangerous things for many women. So we, we are really bold for as long as something is unjust to women, we're going to be there. And so what we say, we describe ourselves that we are champions for gender equality. And so we get money in places where it makes the largest difference. And largest difference for us is not just by the number of populations, because we know that in a globalized world, if a girl is shot up at 
like Malala, like, she, like what happened to Malala. What it did, its most horrible thing, is to show the horrible things that are happening to women and preventing girls to go to education, to, to have an education. And then you could leave that place where Malala came from and place it in any other part of the world. When you hear the famous rape in India, you know that that was not a rape just in India. That young woman lost her life and made it so, it became such a media thing. Those girls in Nigeria that were abducted. So these issues are globalized issues. And we know that especially today with technology and media and everything, we can change many, many laws that will affect millions of women. So when you are a person who is working with the government, with large donors, with a foundation, with a, a law school, etc., and the statement that is usually told about NGOs, NGOs is that they can't scale. Grassroots women, women's organizations, they won't be able to make that change. But at the same time, if you go to a village and you find one woman has spoken up or a woman has taken up an issue, like Samira, or a few years ago, there was a woman who was given to be raped, which is a common thing, by, um, her, by, by relatives of a man who had raped someone else. So you are, the family comes to rape the woman in revenge, these kind of things which happen quite a lot. Those, all of those things, once these women have died, and created a lot of consciousness. We have got lots of saints and heroes that we should be saying have created a lot of consciousness and they scale in this. Perhaps many of you are aware of the large study that was done by, um, um, by the university, uh, I think it's, it's done by, it's, it, 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 the article was published in the American Political Science Review and um, um, it was done over a long time, and um, it actually looked at um, more than 40 uh, countries over uh, a longitudinal study over a very, very long time. And uh, basically, what that study says for a long time, it's the fact, it's the fact that there were feminist women's groups that kept the agenda of violence and removed it from the private into the public, so that today, we can be able to speak about domestic violence or any form of violence on women at the United Nations, in our courts, at universities, etc. But they say it was those women who worked as groups in movements in every part of the world. They say it was not policies, it was not academicians, it was not legal, it was just the activists. And I do believe that this, because this is a a research that was done by universities that were not interested in being the kind of activists that I am, I'm happy to have that kind of research because it's independent research that can really continue to show as other researchers show other evidences of what it means to look at the area of gender justice. So we find these groups so that they can create first the rumor and then the talk, the conversation, and then the bigger conversation that becomes the global conversation. And I tell you today, my sisters and brothers in this room, as we say in Africa, you always, once you eat with the people, you're sisters and brothers, so we eat together. You're my sisters and brothers. Uh, if it had not been for the women activists, we would not have had goal number five of gender justice. But we also would not have not only had that, but we would not have ha have had the consciousness to say every one of those 17 Millennium Development Goals requires gender lens. Otherwise, we will not get there. Thank you. As you heard, I'm happy to take some questions.
Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I happen to be on the advisory, civil society advisory board of the UN Women. And so uh, I'm part of the group that are advising and looking at various uh, issues that we have to deal with uh, as UN Women. So one of what uh, uh, we have come out with is um, a monitoring gender equality and empowerment of women for 2030, which is the agenda that accompanies the sustainable development goals. And basically what this does is look at uh, various indicators for success, not only on the gender equality, but all of the 17 ones. And then in regards, it's really important in terms of a vision to have a big vision. We all know that. Without having a big vision, you can't get somewhere. So you can't cut your, your clothes less, for less than 50. So I think that aim is an aim that says we're just enough not to, not to want to have it all. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm laughing because of the other uh, discussion about women have it at all, which probably you, you know that discussion and the, the, what led to it. But rather, to say really what we are trying to do is get enough really uh, consciousness and actions that say that that's a good way to go, to go 50-50. Shall we get there? I never give up. For me, the glass is always half full and it's never half empty. And I'm going to stay with that and say 50-50 and really mobilize the global women. We are in uh, uh, 175 countries. We have affiliated with us nearly 6,000 women's organizations and millions of women. And we're just going to make a really big noise. And we're going to ask all of you to really like, support this. And if you want your students to do research, let them come to the Global Fund for Women and we'll actually make them make even academic statements about it and do research about it and make it happen. And uh, if you are dealing and wanting to help other people in terms of collaborations in other places, uh, uh, just partner with us. We'll make big noise. And I say we because I want it to be royal in sense of being inclusive of so many other um, people that are going to make big noises out of it. It could be that it's not going to be only women because the current research that is also coming out of uh, the business world, for example, is really taking advantage of the time and trying to say gender parity is going to do this for us. For example, the recent McKinsey report, which came out and said gender parity at work, if that was just practices by, practiced by businesses, we would have in addition to uh, the G GDP another 12 trillion dollars. I don't know what 12 trillion dollars is, but it does look quite a lot of money to go to the GDP. Of, of, yeah. So those kind of studies are sort of like um, a, exciting people. Or a recent study that came out with the, with, from the World Bank, the World Bank did this study on agency and voice and um, uh, said everything that we've said. But in addition, they did say when women, and they quoted Amatya is an Indian economist who was a, a, a prize winner in economics, and he said it millions of years ago, a long time ago, <laughs> and he said that when someone has agency, you know, agency, when somebody has, is an agent of change, the agency, the power from inside, that's really what brings about change. It's not what you give the person. It's the agency coming out of people themselves. The World Bank quoted um, um, Amatia and um, has come up with a lot of good data that they have gathered from the rest of the world. People are reading that. They are reading it a lot more than they have read uh, similar stories that have been told from other places because it's coming from a place that is respected for data 
and for making statements that have a connection to the economics. And I do notice other things that are coming out, even in law. I finished reviewing the 2016 World Bank Law and Business for Women. And um, uh, because I, 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 uh, I am on the uh, working group of gender uh, at the World Bank, and so we try to see how are we going to influence the bank in their thinking of gender. And it's just really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thinking group, it's a work group, it's a hands-on group, it's a worker bees. It's not like a prestigious thing. And it's people from various sectors uh, who have to put your brain in and see what you're going to get out of it, and then how are you going to get that hard in various sectors. And so we know that the reason we participate in those forums with several others, we, we know that we can say these things until the cows come home. But if they are said with people who have influence, so we're looking for people with influence to actually say the things that we believe in, but using our frame and data. So influencing what you do and you find here, when you get it said in the right, with the, from the right mouth at the right time. So for example, you are all aware that before the 1994, there was a working group on human rights to go to the Vienna conference. I was part of that working group, so I know it really well. I was living in Geneva at that time. And tired of being put down on issues about uh, uh, women's rights, every time you brought in domestic violence especially, there were lots of reasons why they didn't want to put domestic violence on. It was, there was always an excuse, either the culture or everything, etc. And working with a woman that is known in this country very well, Charlotte Bunch, she's a lawyer too as well. In the end, the women just gave up and they said, come on, you guys. Women's rights are human rights. And they made sure that that statement was very clearly said by um, um, the first lady of the United States at that time in um, uh, a big forum. And it became something that we could all rally around. So we do want... BAM, um, the, the UN Secretary General to say things, and we want the head of the World Bank to say things, and we want all of these people that are influencers us in the position of influence to say things that we are thinking about because they do have an audience. So 50-50, we, we just make sure that many people say it, and thank you for repeating it because it's getting a hearing. Yes. Yes. I'm going to be very brief now because now I see the questions. Before, there was only one well, question. it's hard so. to start, right? <laughs> so, so. But this follows up really nicely on what you said. And thank you so much for um, your remarks. They were, they were uh, really important. And I'm a big fan of Global Fund for Women, kind of given thank many you. years. So um, it was really an honor to hear you. I actually wanted to see if you would give us any advice because I, so I work mostly in Latin America. Um, in terms of, we've talked a little bit earlier this morning about how the United States is not as good as it thinks it is. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and this is certainly true in terms of like governmental policies um, mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of gender mainstreaming within the state itself. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could offer kind of advice to us in the United States from your experiences more globally about things that we could be doing in the United States to make the United States government and policies more open to uh, issues of women's equality. So like, can you give us lessons from the outside of the world into the U.S.? Thank you. I live here now. And so whatever that is going on here um, concerns me as much. And in our vision of and the Global Fund for Women, we were really careful to be able to say we do want women to be strong, safe, powerful, and heard, no exception. That part, no exception is part of our vision, and it's probably the most important part of our vision. That includes the United States. And um, uh, I have to say to, to you that since I was following the Sustainable Development Goals discussions in various places, there was a lot of discussion that the Millennium Development Goals had just addressed the countries of the South, especially developing countries or poor countries. And there was really a whole intention of discussions that we do need to come out with sustainable development goals that address the whole world, including the United States. So that's one important thing, that people everywhere 
are saying they want the United States to be part of the global collaborations for change. So that's important. And then for your specific questions, on issues, the U.S. was uh, for many, many years a leader in the women's movements in terms of uh, fronting and being the first to shape and speak out and um, campaign on the rights for women. I have not gone somewhere where people who read books don't say they learned something from what was said by people from the United States or a statement that Eleanor Roosevelt managed to put in the Universal Declaration of, the, of, of Human Rights that was referred to earlier by, by one of the sisters. So the U.S. has been there, has walked the road, has been counted. But living here now, I do notice one, I notice sort of like, uh, what do you do when you, you, when you see something happening and you just think somebody else will take care of it? What is it called? There's a, a word for it. Huh? Apathy? Apathy and tiredness from the women activists them, themselves, the U.S. women activists. And that sometimes comes when there is extended privilege uh, in any group of people. And when people think that they have achieved it so they don't need to work very hard, or when people have divisions that they begin to say, even though I believe in this right for women, but I am a Democrat, I'm a Republican, and therefore if I say this and this group really believes in it, I might be misunderstood. So there are a lot of things that are happening here, but I do, what I worry about most is that what happens here in terms of how people look after or don't look after, care or not care for women's rights is very easily exported elsewhere. And we have no right sitting on our loins and not doing something about it because we are then letting that injustice go everywhere. Many of you heard of the um, terrible laws that were coming out in a number of countries in Africa, in Russia, etc., about uh, LGBTQ people being uh, banned. Much of what happened in Uganda was by a lot of activism that came from here, from many religious groups from here. And so the same people that are attacking reproductive rights and uh, making big noise about uh, plant parenthood and killing people, uh, same, same people will be, they will come out from many other parts of the world. So I worry about it. And what we should do, we should do like what the women in the South do. They are not quiet. They are owning their own issues and they are owning their own powers. And so we, the women and men sitting here and sitting in many places, what can you do about it? Because we know what we can do. We have the power. We have money. We have resources. We, we have. And then we should not also divide other rights. I have heard many times when the Black Lives Matter, they are doing something about race. But in order for us to know how to work with difficult issues, we have to join people who already are doing something. So when you can't start something on reproductive rights for women, join Black Lives Matter so that you can learn the trade and the tactics, because the tactics are the same. And when you learn to stand in sympathy to another group, it doesn't matter what that group is. It could be a race, it could be a religion, it could be a sexual orientation. You get the skills and the courage the courage is the hardest thing to get. But when you can stand up and say, we used to stand up before when HIV was coming out and say, I have AIDS, including those that had HIV and did not have HIV. It was like we need to own it and feel what it means to be stigmatized in that issue. And I'm telling you, if many of you can say I want to understand what black lives matter. I am a black person and living in my skin in one day can be able to tell you what it means to have the courage. And then you say it boldly like Mandela said, nobody is born hating somebody else. People learn to hate. And I believe that Mandela was right because that's how I learned my activism. So this is not a, about people of different races or sexes fighting each other but fighting the evil that is within us and sometimes harms us as it harms others. 
That's what we should do in the USA. And I'm with you. I want us to do something about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Musimbi. Um, I have uh, two comments um, coming from uh, your statements about uh, how dangerous it is to be courageous. And um, you celebrate uh, the many women um, who have stood up and uh, be, uh, presented uh, the cases under, uh, under very uh, difficult circumstances. My question in that regard is, uh, how is the Global Fund for Women uh, mobilizing um, to, 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 to protect um, those uh, women of courage or people of courage uh, against uh, backlash? I'm thinking, for example, uh, of the situation in terms of FGM uh, campaigns as, as one example. The other comment I have is to thank you for bringing the women of uh, the Congo to the, uh, uh, to the discussion and uh, the work of people like Josephine that you mentioned. And I want, uh, wonder whether you can comment uh, on the ways we can be in solidarity with Josephine by locating the global economic roots of the kinds of conflicts that are going on in the Congo, mm -hmm. uh, or the extractive industries, who is mm -hmm. privileged um, by those conflicts, who is gaining from mm -hmm. those conflicts, mm -hmm. and how can we be conscientized about some of the, the bigger pictures? Uh, some, yeah. uh, somebody talked about the global yeah. roots of the marginability, particularly of women. Uh, th thank you, Teres, uh, uh, Teresia, my country lady. <laughs> uh, you asked from the perspective of the Global Fund for Women. Let me just say that in the Global Fund for Women, we have decided uh, very consciously to be global. So we have work in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, and uh, North Africa. Um, um, and there we have, uh, by the way, if you later on want to even know things about what's happening with the uh, Syrian refugees that don't make it to Europe because you have a lot of attention to people who get to Europe or have or don't get there and die but we have the eyes of what is happening in countries of the Middle East in Lebanon in Egypt in Jordan in Turkey etc and uh, we've just had a, a group come back with live uh, information about those and we work in Europe and uh, um, uh, um, mostly in Eastern and Central Europe and we are in Asia, mostly Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And then we are in the Americas and Caribbean. And here in the USA, we work, um, and, and Canada, we work mainly with indigenous communities because those indigenous communities do need a, a, a voice. So you asked whether we do uh, um, the, uh, the depth of the social analysis that is able to see who is gaining from what. So the first thing is that we as the Global Fund, we are humble enough to say that we can't do everything. So we actually do three things and we do them really well. <laughs> One, we are interested to ensure that grassroots women or activists who are on the ground and are doing good work, including the work that you have said, are supported. So they are supported by resources that we raise, but we also connect them to the other funders. We also enable them to go to the places of influence and tell their own story and use their own data. You had one of the references to shadow reports. We have financed a lot of shadow reports so that those shadow reports can accompany the reports that governments make of themselves. And then those people usually need to go to those places where the discussions are taking place, whether it's in The Hague or it's in Geneva or in New York or in DC, and give witnesses. And we actually try to ensure that they are going there. So we are humble enough to say, I'm not going to have a staff of so many people doing the things because these things are being done. And we recognize that the people in the South, in the developing country, they have the knowledge. They can do these things. They have people around them who can resource them. And for sustainability, we need to grow that. So we don't grow 
taking technicians from the US or Europe to the South. That, when it happens, we acclaim it because people can finance themselves to go there. Anybody who is here could raise money on themselves and go to any country and help, and we say, hallelujah, we are happy that it's happening. But we don't use our resources for that. Our resources are for the people who are there in that place and are going to be there tomorrow. And if there is a coup, they are the ones who are going to be able to stay there. If there is a flood, they are the ones who are going to stay there. We see that as a means of sustainability, but also a respect for the people working on the ground. And then we trust them. So when before we fund them as we agree on issues of accountability, we actually listen to them and see what they aspire to, to get. What is the outcome they want to see? We tell them what we believe in, and then we find the common ground, and that's what we find. So if that, where we've listened to them, we've said this is what we could do, because we have accountability to our donors, we don't have an endowment. We come and um, all our donors are people like you and myself, and they do it through the um, internet, through checks through us. They are ordinary people who want to be involved in global issues and they say I can't do it alone. So they send their money to the global fund. So we call ourselves a resource mobilizer because if we get several ten thousand, ten um, dollars, a hundred dollars, etc., and put them in one lot, in a year we are able to raise nearly fifteen million dollars. And within those fifteen million dollars we are able to give them away to those activist groups. In, in the amounts that are commensurate with the work that they need, we never have enough because their needs are many, but also the kind of organization so that they can be able not to be found to, um, to use money without <laughs> anyhow, because these are usually committed and they put their own resources. So we're able to give grants anything from 10 to 20 to $30,000, uh, but we give over a long time. So we have got about 3,000 organizations that are registered with us. And in a year, sometimes because you do multi-granting per year, in a year we may be able to give about between four and 6,000 grants that go out. They are the ones who do the analysis. They do the economic analysis. They see if it's an extraction industry who is gaining from it. They see if, they have, um, uh, if there is um, um, a, a corporate in, a, in their own particular place that they feel is using child labor, they do something about the child labor. Trafficking, Global Fund has worked in trafficking because before, before it became popular. So if you wanted to go and look at the root cases of what people, women's groups were doing all over, especially in Asia, we would have those on files. Trafficking, we find them there and then they work on the grassroots, they work at that policy level, etc. They are the ones who do it. So we don't do it here. We raise money, we give it, and then we amplify their voices. How do we amplify their voices? We talk about it, we do social media, and nowadays we are also taking volunteers from everywhere, go into our website, take the thing to the next step in your Facebook, in your social media. We have prob very, very, very large social media. We are, but we amplify the voices of the people through that. We amplify their voices by doing some of the things that I told you, that is taking them to the places where they are, and then encouraging universities to study and publish about, about them. Well, that's really is important. That's the way we amplify their voices. Yes. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for your inspiring remarks. I was a, a bit surprised to hear reference to Mother Teresa in your comments. Yeah. One of her one of the great passions of her life and, and central themes of her work was to resist what she considered to be the great evil of birth control spreading throughout the rural and poor parts of India and to resist the spread of access to, um, to reproductive freedom or abortion. Mm -hmm. And so that squared for me the question that I really wanted to ask you, which was to share, ask if you would share with us your general thoughts about the tension that always emerges when you, um, in, in the ambition to transform norms or to change and challenge norms, um, the, the tension that that project inevitably confronts with being sensitive to and respectful of um, 
cultures and uh, cultural norms in the places where you're endeavoring to have some influence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, culture is, uh, I'll just take from the last, uh, you said too many things there. For example, the whole issue about ab abortion is a, a big topic that I would love to get engaged on because it's a, an area that I've spent a lot of time on in the sexual reproductive health and uh, 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 also deepened my knowledge a lot in that area of what is happening in the world as I worked at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and was responsible uh, for their work in, in uh, sexual reproductive health and population. So this whole issue of population and sexual reproductive health is some place that um, I have some understanding and would like to go deeper, but I wanted to just take your last one because uh, uh, it's important. I had what you used words such as respect of the culture and so on that are often uh, good, polite words of, uh, of, uh, uh, that we all embrace because we do really want to be respectful of people. Cultures are two-edged swords in every place, but they, you, we could never say that cultures have not changed. Cultures are um, they're living things. They change. I am a linguist by academic training first before anything else. And um, in, in, in language, you see how language shapes what people believe in, how they say it, but then how that same language can be changed. You can transform what you believe today about um, any topic, about whether it is something that harms uh, or interferes with bodily integrity, or whether it's something that um, harms our, our, uh, our, our um, psyche, because when we talk about the health of a person, it's beyond the physical, it's the psyche, and that part of it is really as, just as important. So cultures, when people, when you believe in something at the moment, you who is the believer in that thing that becomes part of your culture, you really believe in it. You believe that it's the right thing to do. But sometimes it may require someone else to tell you that this is not the right thing to do. Because sometimes people don't discover what is wrong within their culture inside. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Even cultures of organizations. Sometimes you can practice something in an organization for a very long time until you see that either it has dwarfed you and the organization is not growing or it's bringing tensions. And sometimes you keep dealing with those tensions, but you never get to the root cause of, of it. Now it's the same with cultural practices that are traditionally based, that are very often gendered, that are very much passed on because somebody is gaining from them. Whoever is gaining from them, man, woman, or whatever it is, and how they are perpetuated. Because you will see, when something is being protected in a culture, there's usually a ring of people around it that become the ambassadors for that culture. And they become the ambassadors one, it, to create some fear of, uh, if you do this, this will happen to you. If you... Um, don't marry your girl when she's 11. She could lose her virginity, for example. Or there used to be a culture in my tradition that said uh, it prevented uh, uh, females to eat eggs. And there was something around it that said if females ate eggs, they would die. <laughs> That's really big. <laughs> and if you don't want to die, you don't eat no egg. <laughs> So that was really big. And nobody tried the eggs we were told before, those traditions. And I don't know how long it was there, but just females didn't eat the eggs. And other females told other females like that. And the men in my tradition must have eaten all of the eggs that there were and, and they enjoyed it. And so people somewhere came in and said, no, you wouldn't die. And somebody ate and didn't die. And that was the end of the, 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 the culture. So uh, all I want to say to you is that what is going on here in terms of the reproductive, sexual reproductive health uh, is a culture too in this place. It's a, it's a, a culture that is grounded into some ways of interpreting um, religion and how God looks at us. My other part is theology. <laughs> I am a linguist and a theologian. My other part is theology. And again, if you look at what many of the theologians have done who analyze the perspective of just from the deity, the God self, and how we humans sometimes place ourselves into that God self and become the judge, the judges, or how we interpret what we have received in the Holy Scriptures of any tradition at all, you will see that it's a cultural thing as well, and there's some power there that we are claiming 
either we are claiming the power that we want to be, we are defending God, or we are def and we feel so much that we are the prophets and the people who are called there, the defendants, and we are convinced about it. Because culture, when you defend it, you have a, such a personal conviction that you even put your own life on line. But some people challenge it, and sometimes you come to your own senses, sometimes you are forced into your own senses by the changing circumstances. Reproductive rights in this country, they went quite ahead, and now the carpet is being pulled on some of the freedoms that women have achieved. But I don't think it will ever be the same. I learned when I was working in reproductive health that some of the people who actually advocated for safe abortion in this country were also from the religious communities because they visited hospitals, they saw the sick people, and they saw how many women were dying from unsafe abortions. And they came to a conviction that that was not of God. So I, am, I have learned the history that inclusive of those groups were also some people who came from the faith communities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I have one request. Would you just play that clip? Because I don't think we were paying attention. I wanted you to see the clip because it's what describes what I do. And I thought I wanted to, for you to see. And thank you so much for having an afternoon with all of you today.